Good afternoon, everybody. Okay. Today we're talking about the lower limb and we're talking specifically about the hip. Okay. But first of all, we have to learn what is basically the function of the lower limb. Um, the lower limb, if we will look at it, uh, the main function of the lower limb is to help support our body weight but at the same time to help us be able to have a good base foundation in terms of standing, walking, and running. And one of the, one of the part of the limb basically is the hip, okay? Okay, so everybody here know how hip looks like, right? Okay, so if you will look at it, we don't have we don't have the um, we don't have the um, the femur, but I'll have a picture here. So the let's go. Is oh, is that one? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I I actually added another clip here. Okay, let's just go to this picture first. Okay, if you will look at the the picture here, this is basically the iliac crest and the, the femur. Now, if you will look at this two joint, you will think that there are just two pieces, two, kind, two pieces of bone, <laughs> okay? But actually, it's not. And I'll show you why. If you, can you see the, the structure here? If you will look at this one here, the upper part is actually an ilium, okay? It's a, one piece of bone, and on the right side, you will see here the ilium, and then this ischium. There are three bones, that were fused together and they form this what we call acetabulum. Acetabulum is basically this structure here. Now, if you will look at the, okay, let's pretend this is the femur. This is how it looks like in a drawing. If you will look at the drawing right now, what you see here is a right femur, okay? Right femur and it is attached to the socket here, which is acetabulum, and we call this basically a ball and socket. Why ball and socket? If you will look at the femur, the structure here, it's like a ball. And this one here is like a, a, definitely a socket, so that's why they call it ball and socket. Now, if you will look at the, the, the shoulder, if you will compare shoulder and hip, they're actually almost the same, but opposite in many ways. Why? If you will look at the hip joint, let's go back to this one. If you will look at the hip joint, this is the very, it, it is very stable joint compared to, to the shoulder. Shoulder, they have the same structure, but the difference is that the shoulder has very shallow, shallow fossa. That's why you would notice a lot of people have injury on the shoulder. The, the hip joint is very stable, so it's not really very common to have injury unless there is a trauma that could possibly happen to it, or if not, it's a pathology like osteoporosis or osteoarthritis. And I will, I will expand more on that later. Now, let's go back to this. Uh, before, before I forget, if you have any questions, probably just reserve it later so we can go through all the notes. And I will not also... Um, we will have a better flow of the lectures, and then we will have the question and answers later. Now, so you, if you will look at the femur here, I will not give you, I will not give you the details of the part of the bone, but I will give you specific areas that are very important. If you will look at the, the structure here right now, that's the head, this is the neck, and this is the shaft. And the femur is one of the longest bone in our body. So remember that. Hip is very special. Why? Because it is the most stable joint in our body. Second, it is the longest. The femur is the longest bone in our body. So basically, and that's one of the things you can remember with the hip. Now, if you will look at, so if you will look at this one, this is the neck. This is also the common area where we have fracture. And then this is the, um, and also the shaft. This is basically, if you will look at this area, this is the greater tuberosity, lesser tuberosity, okay? Same, um, same with shoulder, they have the same, um, the same part, but again, why, what's, the, what's the importance of those, those parts? That is mostly 
the part that a lot of our muscles on the hip are being attached. And we will talk about that more later. Okay. Now, one of the things with hip, if we know that there is pathology, you will know that there is a problem on the hip because you can easily see the way they walk. When someone is walking, you know something's wrong. But always remember, when a person has hip, hip problem, it does not mean that the problem is specifically localized to the hip. Sometimes it can be, real, it, it can be a pain on the sacroiliac joint, which is this one, the sacroiliac joint, and also the lower limb, which is the knee or the foot. So usually the therapist, when they do the, um, when they do the assessment, Let's say patient complain of hip problem, they will look at the hip. But then sometimes as they do the assessment, they would see, as they do the different tests, they will see that, oh, it's not really from the hip. So it is imperative that we also look at the sacroiliac joint and also down below the knee, okay, and all the way to the feet, okay. Okay, where are we now? Now, why also, why the hip joint is very stable? One of the reasons why the hip joint is very stable because they also, they are, they are, they are, there's three ligaments that are very, very strong that is attached to the ligament. And these are actually two kinds of ligament, okay, three. I'll, I'll tell you um, the iliofemoral ligament, okay. The iliofemoral ligament, the ischiofemoral ligament, and the pubofemoral ligament. So you'll probably be confused, what are these ligaments? So for you to, re to easily uh, understand, iliofemoral ligament, remember that big bone here? Okay. See the ilium here? That's this, the, the one of the ligament is attached to that and attached to the femur. So that's why they call it iliofemoral ligament. And this actually, this iliofemoral ligament here actually help stabilize your hip and avoid your hip from doing hyperextension, okay? So this is one of the, and then they call that uh, ligament or why Bigelow ligament because of how it is formed. So if you will look at it, see, it's basically like a Y form. The ischiofemoral ligament, the ischio do you, uh, it's a little clear, right? The ischiofemoral ligament here, which is the, the, the weakest part of the ligament because of how it is formed. So if you will look at the, the bone here, so it is attached, attached here, and it's a little bit of a spiral. So if we will look, so from here, so it is attached like this one. The form is basically spiral. See this one here? It goes posteriorly. So when you pull that, the, the, uh, the stability is not so good. So that's the considered as the weakest ligament, okay? And then we have the pubofemoral ligament, which is basically over here, the pubofemoral ligament, which help stabilize your hip when you do abduction, okay? So that's basically the, the ligaments that are comprises the hip joint. But there are also two more ligaments that are also very important, which is the transverse acetabular ligament, which is, if you will look at here, that's the round ligament there. And there is where the blood vessels passes by. And then there's another one, if you will look at the bone here, on the head of the, head of the femur, there is a small um, hole. And we call that actually the um, uh, linea aspera. Okay, so vea capitis, where the blood vessels goes to supply blood to the to the to the bone. Now, let's go to this one. Now, what are the muscles surrounding surrounding the hip joint? If you will look at that, these are the muscles that you see on the front, and these are what we call the uh, quads muscles. I want you to touch your thigh on the medial aspect, basically here. That's your muscle, which is the vastus medialis, okay? Okay, 
and then if you touch the side here, vastus lateralis, okay, and then the one on top is the uh, biceps femoris, uh, the how do you call it? rectus femoris, and underneath is an inter, inter uh, vastus intermedius. Now, I want you to remember that these muscles on the hip are very important because it helps bend your hip, and also it helps extend your knee. Okay. And then, go there. And if you will look at the muscles at the back, that's your the muscles at the back. That's the muscles that is responsible for extending your hip. Okay and then bending the knee. Okay. And then if you will look at the buttock area, that's the muscles that will help you extend, extend your, basically help with the abduction. So when you stand on one leg, those are the muscles that help you be able to stand properly, okay? So if you will look at this one here, a lot of area here is the, the iliotibial band, Sometimes when this iliotibial band is very tight, it gives a lot of pain on the hip and also on the knee. Okay, so we'll go to the ligaments. So we already spoke about the ligaments, now we'll go to the cartilage. Okay, I want you to remember that there are different kinds of cartilages. One is what we call the articular, um, the articular cartilage, which is basically you see in the, in the knee and you see on the vertebral spine. Then we have also a cartilage that is on, on your ear, okay, which we call that elastic cartilage. Um, and also the, um, the one that we see basically in the, in the joint of the hip, which is the um, the hyaline cartilage, okay, hold on, let me just see, which is hyaline cartilage or fibrocartilage. Now, I want you to remember that the cartilage has no blood supply. That's one reason why a lot of us, um, remember I told you a while ago, there is, uh, there's no way you can injure the hip because of the stability or the structure of the hip. The only way you can have problem with the hip is when you have uh, you develop osteoporosis or osteoarthritis, or if not, you have a trauma on the hip. What happened is the cartilage that is enclosed to the, okay, you see this one here? The cartilage that is enclosed on the head of the femur has no blood supply, has no blood supply. So when we're young, our cartilage is very, um, our cartilage is very, very nice. It's thick. So what happened is its ability to support, its ability to support the joint is very good. Okay, it support as a shock absorption, okay? It, it helps with absorption of the, the, the joint. Now what happened is as we get older, those cartilage wear off. Why? Because what happened when our immune system started to be, to be weaker, its ability to produce, uh, produce glucosamine is no longer there. Now, what is the importance of glucosamine on the joint? Okay, always remember, our body produces glucosamine, okay, produces glucose and glutamine, which is essential in the production of, of glucosamine so that the glucosamine will produce glyco glycoaminoglycans, which is essential in the production of the, of the uh, cartilage. Now, what happens as we get older, this cartilage wear off. Every time we, okay, always remember when we stand up, the, uh, based on study, we actually put like three to four times body weight on the cartilage. So as time goes on, as we get older, those cartilage become worn out. So that's why, and then the doctor would, the only, the last resort when it's become very, very, very bad, they have to do the hip replacement because there's no way the cartilage um, regenerate, okay? That's why, but there's also a saying, that I, I've read an article that if you eat healthy, your body can still produce glucosamine to help development of cartilage. 
Okay, so cartilage is very important in the hip joint because it serves as an absorption. It serves as a shock absorber, okay? Now, always remember that in the joint, in the, in the, in the, in the joint, there is what we call uh, a synovial fluid that help be able to, that help the, um, the joint be able to move properly. Now, let's go for the tendon. Okay, tendons are basically, when you talk about tendons, we are referring to the muscles. Which, the muscles, for it, for it to attach to a bone, it needs to be uh, turned into a tendon. So I will show you again how it looks like. So see this one here? This is the vastus, uh, the quads muscles. For it to attach to the bone, it becomes into a tendon. Okay, I already mentioned this a while ago with regards to the physiology of the hip. So basically, the, the, the hip is called a multi axial joint because of the different directions that it does from flexion, extension, abduction, adduction. So basically, it, it, it does all those motions, okay? That's why they call it multi axial just like with the shoulder. Now, what are the different types of hip dysfunction. One is fracture. Always remember that when we, when we have, uh, when we're playing, right, um, one of the things that could happen is fracture. One of the things that I've said a while ago, the hip is the most stable joint in our body. The only way you can have injury on the hip is either you have uh, uh, a trauma, okay, or uh, a pathology which is osteoporosis or osteoarthritis. Now, what happens with fracture is that when you have repetitive move, repetitive uh, activity, that can actually um, um, aggressive activity like the football, um, basketball, any Im higher impact could lead to fracture. And most of the time, that would 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 fracture is the area where the neck is or the the shaft of the femur. And then we also have this what we call stress fracture, which they said even heal lesser. You know why? Because um, the reason why there is uh, the reason why there is uh, stress fracture because there are people that they do exercises in a way wherein it is very very repetitive and high impact. I'm not okay. I love plyometrics, but sometimes when people are not doing um, are not doing plyometrics the proper way, they can, they can possibly uh, fracture themselves, you know, because you have to remember, when you do a lot of repetitive activity and then speed, higher speed, increased duration, increased frequency, increased intensity, you're not giving proper time for your muscles and your bone to adapt to the, to, to the activity. So that's what happened, why people have fracture because of that, because it's putting a lot of stress on the bone itself, okay? Now, ligament sprain. Okay, when you say ligament sprain, you are referring to uh, a ligament, okay? Ligament, basically, um, you're referring to the injury on the ligament, okay? Muscle strain, when you say muscle strain, you are referring to the strain on the muscles and the tendon. So what Usually what happens, that one, one possible uh, uh, cases that can happen is when you are doing exercises. When I was young, I remember one of the, one of the advice is stretch before and after. But now they're doing a lot of research now that stretching should not be done prior to warm up. Now it's better to warm up prior to stretching. I, it's better to warm up prior to stretching. Why? Because when you warm up, you're putting more blood flow to the area, so it makes the tendon and the muscles pliable. So it's easier to stretch them. What happens is when you immediately stretch, if you're not doing it properly, you're not careful, there's always a possibility of you um, straining that muscle or even tear it. 
So that's one of the things that you have to remember when you're doing your exercises. Now, cartilage injury. Okay, remember the, the, what I told you a while ago? Our bone is actually covered with cartilage. It's covered with cartilage. As we get older, this cartilage wear off. This cartilage wear off. So because of that, the, the bone, um, the covering of the bone was not there anymore. So the shock absorbed, the, the, the absence of the cartilage on a joint will, uh, the absence of cartilage in the joint will certainly put a lot of pressure or a lot of trauma to the joint. That's why we started to have inflammation. We started to have pain because of that. So cartilage actually is very important in our body. Unfortunately, as we get older, the cartilage, our uh, cartilage doesn't regenerate, okay? Um, but you can actually, you can actually help, you can actually help. There's a research that I've, I've read that you can, even though you're older, if you're eat, we're eating healthy, we're eating food for the immune system, our body can still naturally produce cartilage. So it doesn't matter regardless of how old we are. If we are eating healthy, especially food for the immune system, it will definitely, definitely help our body produce cartilage. Now, what in terms of supplementation, which we will discuss later, I'll, I'll, I'll discuss that again later. Uh, we will talk about that later. Now, bursitis. If you will look at the, this picture, Okay, if you will look at this um, bursa, bursa is like a, a sack, which, is com uh, which consists of water, fluid. It's just like, okay, imagine a picture of the egg, the egg, okay? The, exactly that's the structure of, of, of uh, uh, a bursa and the synovial fluid that is in there. It serves as a cushion on, the, on, on, your, on your joint. It helps be able to... When you, when, you, when you move, it helps basically uh, with, its, uh, with your mobility, okay? Especially the synovial area, synovium that is in there. So what happens is when you constantly, that's one thing, when you're doing a lot of exercises that are very, I see people do exercise, just one exercise is doing 100 repetition. Don't you know that when you're doing a lot of repetition, on your, you're putting a lot of stress both, on the tendon, the muscles, and also on your bursa. So that's one reason why people have pain on the hip because of the, the bursa are also inflamed. So there are, they said that on the hip area, there are at least 20, 20 kinds of bursa that is located on the hip. So those are one of the things that, um, that um, you will see on the hip. So most of most of the most of the hip dysfunction that actually occur is because of excessive excessive um, exercises. So always remember anything that is excessive and anything that is less also is not is not a good thing. I I believe on different kinds of method of exercise, but I'm a fan of overloading technique. Overloading technique is a kind of exercise where you do heavy load, you do it slowly and you do it in less number of repetition. Why? Because you're putting less stress to the joint and you, you, you recruit more muscles and then you recruit more muscles and you also develop the strength faster. So people that have no time to do strengthening, overloading technique is always I recommend. So because always remember when you're doing so much repetition, again, you may not feel it now, but in time, with all those uh, friction that you're putting on the, on the, on the joint, that will actually uh, aggravate it. Another one, when you're bending, when you're bending, then they said, uh, when you're bending and you're doing the bicycle, make sure also one of the things that you have to remember is look at the height of the chair. Because when you look at the when you just sit on the chair and your knee is so, so low, your, your knee is higher than your hip, you're putting a lot of stress on the hip and on your kneecap and also the tendon that is attached to the knee. So what happens when you're 
approximately 20 to 30 degrees. When you're doing that bike there, again, that actually causes a lot of wear and tear on the tendon. So those things you have to avoid. The, what I usually advise with my patient when, when they're doing the bike, go on the head or the, the head area of the bone, of the femur, and then that's where you put the, the seat. But sometimes you can still change because depending on the height of a person. So, but that's the baseline. Don't, when you're doing the bike, avoid sitting on a chair where, I, avoid sitting on a bike where it's too low because if not, eventually you'll have problem on the hip and on the knee. Okay, risk factors of uh, hip dysfunction. You want to do that? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, Mike, will, we'll continue with this one. Okay. Okay, thanks, Liz. And uh, I guess you guys are all, all experts on the anatomy and physiology of the hip, so we don't have to talk too much about what's involved with the hips. Everybody can go to their, their uh, orthopedist and explain everything about you know, how my hip works, right? Well, it, the hip is very complicated. Um, and as Lily was explaining, all the ligaments and the muscle attachments to the hip, it's, it's a very important one. Um, why do you think? I mean, why, why is the hip such, such an important joint um, for our everyday activity, primarily? What does it help us with, primarily? Exactly. Anyone else? Right. So all of our weight is distributed directly through the hip. So this is the pivotal point where our upper body meets our lower body. So all the stresses are related to Another important thing about the hip and the pelvis is this is where most of the balance comes from when we're standing. So when we're standing, if we don't have any stability at our hip joint, you know, our gluteal muscles, our uh, hip flexors, oh, thank you, so now they can hear me online. So one of the things that you can do is uh, if those muscles are weak, our sense of balance is also going to be very weak. Um, our pelvis is also controlled by our abdominal muscles. Like I said, our gluteal muscles, our hamstrings, everything kind of pivots around, uh, around, the, uh, um, around the pelvis and around the, the hip joint itself. Now, one quick trivial question. What allows us as humans, compared to other animals, to stand upright? What particular muscle is much more defined in humans that allows us to stay upright? It's, like, it's an interesting muscle muscle itself that attaches to the pelvis and to the hip. Any guesses? Yeah, our brain controls this muscle. So in, in essence, I mean, it is the, the brain that controls everything. But there's one muscle in particular that many people, and some people maybe more than others, have accentuated. <laughs> and a lot of dances like salsa, they, they kind of promote this a little bit more. So I think you got the idea. Can you mention it? The rear end. Okay, the gluteal muscles. And it, that's basically, in comparison to all other animals, that's what allows us to stand upright and to be able to walk. The ratio of the size of the gluteus maximus and the gluteal muscles compared to our overall size and weight allows us to stand, stand upright. And why is it so important anyway for, for people, especially as we get older? Because our balance and our stability and our ability to walk and, and get ourselves from one Part or part from uh, point A to point B is really controlled by, by these muscles. So if we have difficulty walking, uh, difficulty with our balance, our loss of balance, uh, one of the main things to work on is exercising and building up the strength in these muscles, in particular, particularly with our gluteal muscles, which really control a lot, of these, a lot of these aspects. Now let me ask all of you, how many of you have had back pain or have had hip pain or um, currently have any, any form of hip pain. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, four. Now, how many of you have had back pain at all in your lives? Okay, that's like almost, almost everybody. Now, you know, it, it's really interesting that, you know, the back and the hip are so interrelated. Uh, like Lily was saying, the hip joint is a very stable joint but it also has an effect on the back too. Just as Lily was explaining, the sacrum and the iliac, 
So the hip joint really kind of controls a lot of the back movements too. So one of the conditions a lot of times when people may end up having, uh, and we'll, we'll discuss a little bit more of this because you know, people that have heard or seen my lectures before know how I love to talk about posture and how we should be symmetrical and be in symmetry at all times. But a lot of times what can happen is that people, they fall out, out of symmetry. And people, which is not a misconception, can have one leg longer than the other. If you've heard of that, you know, one leg feels like it's longer than the other. Now, why is that significant, do you think? Well, the significance is that if one leg is longer than the other, you'll have a twisting force in the pelvis. So if I take this out, this pin, if it doesn't come out, it's fine also. But you'll have almost a twisting force at the pelvis. And one side will twist more than the other. So this is the back where the spine is, all the muscles in the back here. So if the pelvis is twisted upwards, and this is exaggerated, no one's pelvis is ever going to turn out that way, but you'll have pressure on one side of the back. So one side will be kind of leaning more towards the other. And that's all related to the hip. Even though you won't feel it a lot of times at the hip, it will play an effect on the back. That's why you hear many more people saying that I've had back pain as in comparison to hip pain, just because they're so interrelated. And just like Lily said, it also plays a factor in, uh, in knee pain and even, um, you know, even in, in your ankles. Your ankles can actually be affected because of the hip because a lot of the same muscles affect one versus the other. So that's why it's really important to make sure that we look at, and this is what, as physical therapists, we, we specialize, we look at the, the overall structure of the body, and we look at the, the alignment, and we look at which muscles are causing this misalignment or this asymmetrical uh, positioning of the body. So if there isn't that symmetry, we have to work on getting your body back into that symmetrical state. So that we're not compensating, so that not we're not leaning on one side, so we're not putting pressure on one side of the spine versus the other, or the pelvis versus the other. Um, what are some of the risk factors? And then we'll go over a little bit more about stability and um, posture and what we can do to relieve ourselves. And a lot of times, even relieve back pain just because we're working on on the hip muscles and on the hip area. So some of the risk factors: the Q angle. Lily didn't really talk too much about this, but the hip angle, or the Q angle, you did? No, that's okay. We'll go over it real quick. It's not, it's not very, very uh, uh, significant, but the Q angle is basically um, the degree where your hip meets, meets your knee. Now, another million dollar question. What is the main difference of the Q angle between men and women? Exactly. So... And why, why do women have a larger Q angle or a wider pelvis than, than men? Exactly. For the birth canal, basically. Now, the Q angle is really important because the wider the hip, the angles, those, those Q angles will be more significant. And when you have a wider angle like that, you may also end up developing more conditions. There may be more instability at the hip because of those, those larger angles. That's why there are higher incidences of knee and hip uh, dislocation or injury in women versus men. I mean, if you've heard of that in sports, uh, ACL tears are much more common in, in women. Well, I wouldn't say much more common, or more common in women than in men uh, because, of, because of that, that uh, genetic uh, predisposition to that, uh, that condition. So uh, that's one of the factors. And let's go back. Uh, hip antiversion and retroversion, and that's not, that doesn't refer to style. It refers to the position of the, of the femur. So even though this is the humerus or the shoulder, we're not going to consider that. This is, let's say, the, the femur. And antiversion is the position or the movement anteriorly or forward of the femur, of the, the femur inside the acetabulum. Retroversion is the degree of movement behind, retro, moving inwards inside the femur. Now these two pathologies, uh, well not really pathology, but structural uh, differences are going to affect the hip a little bit more because if you're a little bit more anti-verted, 
not only will it cause structural changes at the knee, and sometimes even at the ankle, but it, it also has your, uh, people are more disposed or predisposed at tearing their cartilage or the, um, uh, the, uh, the cartilage that holds the femur inside the acetabulum or the, the uh, in, inside the glenal uh, fossa, the acetabulum, I'm sorry. Um, the other thing, if you're retroverted, then people, if you've noticed, the head of the, the femur is further in, it's deeper in. Sometimes that can cause or lead more to degeneration of the hip and cause more arthritis later on uh, in life. So that's another, another uh, structural change that sometimes we have absolutely no control with. Uh, sometimes people are born uh, with dislocated or hip dysplasia, and those cause those predis or predisposed to those conditions, cause those structural changes. Yes? Has it been shifted forward? No, it's, it's really, well, it's all in relations to the head of the, the femur. So with, with an antiversion, you're actually getting a twisting, twisting movement. So it doesn't actually physically move out of the acetabulum. It's just rotated out that way. And that's significant because now you have more of the, the head of the, the femur uh, coming out of the acetabulum. Because of that, it's antiverted. And if we get into details, it can also affect the knees also because as you're antiverted, the twisting force will actually cause the knee to start twisting out. So sometimes causing pigeon toed or, or um, you know, walking with your toes pointed, pointed outwards. And that's another condition that can cause problems with your knees uh, because, of, because, of, because of the hip. That's why it's, it's so important to know exactly where the problem stems from and what we can do to correct that problem because it could be caused by something completely different from where our pain is. So we have to know exactly what to do to correct that. Um, I hope that answers your question. So those are the, those two uh, structural changes that people may have. Uh, ligamentous laxity is something, again, we have no control over, and that's just some of the ligaments inside the hip may be a little bit looser. People have been, uh, have been, uh, are, are told to be double jointed or triple jointed. I don't know if any of you are double or triple, triple jointed, but that's ligamentous laxity. That's when your ligaments are very stretched and very loose and allow you to curl up, and those contortionists probably have plenty of that throughout their entire body, and they're able to contort into those positions. But it's not always good because with ligamentous laxity, you can come, it comes also injuries with that. So this hip dislocations, talking specifically with the hip and other, other conditions. Yeah. Yeah, that's something, something we're, we're, we're unfortunately uh, some people have and that will cause uh, those risk factors or higher risk for injuries at the hip. Structurally, we, we can't do anything about them. I mean, surgically, we can do something about them. But physically, without actually going in and changing the structure, we really can't do anything about it. Gender, definitely we can't do anything about Well, you know, now anything's possible. So, uh, yes. Yeah, flat feet affect a lot of different things. High arches are also, you know, going to affect the hip. It's going to affect the knees. Going to affect the, the back. I mean, that's a, the whole other whole other class of subjects. Uh, talking about the ankle and the foot. You know, if you're flat footed, you may have a tendency of being uh, knock knees or bow bow legged. And if you have high arches, you're actually uh, can be more knock knees in, in that respect. Again, putting more pressure on your on your hips, on your back throws off your whole alignment. So again, looking at each individual piece and seeing exactly what, what's going on is important to, to, to all those factors, all those injuries that people may end up, end up having. So yeah, flat feet are never, never a good thing. And that's why they banned people in the Army for many years if they were flat-footed. But now there are corrective measures. You can wear insoles. You can wear orthotics to be able to help that. And I've seen a lot of people with hip pain or sometimes even back pain have relief just by adding insoles or adding these arch supports uh, to their shoes. And it makes, a, makes a big difference. Again, changes the structure of the body, makes us more symmetrical when we're doing activities. That's, that's again, very key uh, to being in good health, especially with the back and the pelvis and the hip. OK, so occupation. I think this gentleman's occupation is a little bit more stressful, puts him at higher risk than a normal person for hip dislocation, hip injuries. 
So any type of trauma, like Lily said, is really the most um, or the highest cause of any type of problems at the hip. So car accident uh, and any type of fall on the hip is a very, very, uh, you know, can cause some severe changes and, and detrimental uh, conditions to the hip. Um, that's why, again, our balance is controlled by a pelvis and our hip, and we want to make sure that we are always, uh, always as strong as we could be in our balance because having a fall along with osteoporosis or osteopenia can be detrimental. People that have that, especially if they have a fracture at the head or at the surgical neck, the neck of the, the femur, will almost likely need a hip replacement after that. And there are all their other conditions, especially for the elderly, that if they're in that position, they're unable to move and causes a lot of different other conditions. So that's why it's best to take care of those things. Keep yourself strengthen, keep your, your body as flexible as possible, keep yourself in symmetry. So let's talk a little bit about, um, let us talk about our posture, my favorite topic. So prevention of hip dysfunction. So I don't know if you guys have ever seen this model before, but this is the wrong way, and this is also the wrong way that we should be standing. And I tell people, always draw an imaginary line. The imaginary line for proper posture is an imaginary line from your, from your ear to your shoulder to your hip to behind your knee to in front of your ankle. Ideally, this is the right posture. <laughs> A good 90% of the people are either in this posture or moving into this posture. So that's that's a big, big problem for a lot of people. And that's why you know, education is really important and that that uh, uh, expression that mother always said, you know, keep keep your back straight, you know, shoulders back. It, it's it's not it's not a misconception. It's true. We should we should be doing that uh, when we're walking. I, I tell people, even if you're in these positions, and it's very hard for people that have been in that position for a very long time to move yourself out of that position. Try to be aware and be conscious about how we should be aligned. So look at yourself in a mirror. See where where your neck and where your shoulders lie and your compared to your ear and compared to your hips and compared to your knees and see what, what area you should be focusing a little bit more on and work on that. If it's your shoulders, if you're rounded shoulders or you're noticing that you're kind of arching forward a little bit, you know, work on kind of bringing your shoulders back a little bit. Just being that slight bit conscious about moving your body into that position again can have such a good effect on your body. And you know, a lot of people that we've made those corrective changes, you know, be a little bit more aware that your shoulders should be back or bring your head a little bit further back or, you know, bring your pelvis a little bit further forward without slouching backwards. Doing those things, especially I notice people that, that stand all day or they're working and they're in those positions, by making those small little changes, you can have a good effect. It may relieve a lot of the pain on your shoulders, may relieve a lot of back pain, a lot of hip pain along with that. Um, when we're out of this upright posture, this good posture, we can cause a lot of pain. Like this gentleman, may end up with back pain, end up with neck pain, may end up with hip pain and leg pain. And that's why a lot of times I notice that sometimes these problems come on all at once without even realizing it. Like how many of you have had, that have had back, back pain? Do you know the real cause of the back pain? A lot of people come in and they say, well, I don't know how it happened. You know, I just started feeling back pain one day. Well, it could be because of over time being in a bad posture and being asymmetrical, you're doing something and you're moving in a certain position will cause those types of injuries, will cause you to become out of a line and cause problems, even though you didn't have a fall or you didn't go to lift something heavy without even realizing it, but over the course of time, you may end up developing developing those problems with your hip, with, with your, your back and other body parts because we're not aligned and we're not symmetrical with what we're doing things. We're not keeping the proper body mechanics. And their Tai Chi instructor, I'm sure, will agree with me with that. And primary importance even in uh, those type of activities. So sitting posture, same thing. One of, one of the, the worst things, and people are recognizing how important it is, ergonomics in the office space, one of the biggest things right now is keeping uh, people that are sitting at an office, you know, sitting upright in the right posture. They have physical therapists now that are on staff in a lot of these office buildings just to set up a 
an office space ergonomically correct because people now notice that it's much better to pay a physical therapist to set up a workstation correctly one time than later on having to spend you know thousands of dollars on uh, you know medical equipment, physical therapy, uh, surgery, going to doctors because of an injury sustained at, at the workplace. So what I tell people and um, you can request one of these these pictures later on. I have a bunch. I didn't bring it with me right now. But keeping the computer monitor, even though this is an old computer monitor, at your eye level. The first, the top third of the uh, the computer screen should be at your eye level. Shoulders again should be just like the standing position at your ear level. Your elbows should be bent at about 90 degrees, and they should be parallel to the floor. This picture doesn't show it, but it's good to have even some wrist support or something resting on top of your wrist so that your wrists are never in this position or in that position, which can cause what type of condition? Carpal tunnel. Right. Keeping your hip at about 90 degrees or even a little bit less, and keeping some type of foot support or footstool is also very good. Knees at about 90, 90 degrees and, uh, and using an armrest so that your shoulders are always rested. You're not sitting down with your arms overreached without any type of support. Keep everything close by. Don't overreach with things. And that's a proper, proper model to follow. Okay, so now we get to, to the treatment of... Uh, of any type of hip pain or hip uh, dysfunction. So again, like I stressed this enough, proper posture. Um, avoid aggravating activities. What are some aggravating activities that we can do? Well, one activity is, is keeping yourself always always on your knees. And that's, that's one of the worst things uh, that we notice. And I mentioned this in the knee lecture that we had last month, but um, maybe I'll ask all of you again. What are what is the one profession that comes in most commonly with knee pain or knee replacements that you can think of? I know this is the knee, but it's kind of related to the hip also. It's interesting. I'll tell you. People that lay carpet. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Why? Because they're always squatting. They're always putting their knees down. So they're always having pressure through their kneecaps, through their patella. But it's related with the hip also because if we're in, always in that position, a lot of times people have a tendency, and I'll do it right now even though how bad it is, they'll have a tendency of putting their, their hips out this way, which is called W-sitting. It's something that in the peds physical therapy world, when dealing with children, we try to get children out of that position because we know how bad it is on the hips. So W-sitting, when your legs are out, spread out, you're really putting a lot of stress on the hip. What are you doing when you're doing that? You're actually pushing or retroverting that that femur inside the acetabulum, uh, wearing away a lot of that cartilage, that fibrous cartilage that's so valuable that we can't regenerate over time. That's avascular, just like Lily said. So putting a lot of stress through our legs, carrying heavy loads, you know, through our body. You know, again, the stress points are at the are at the hips, and um, if it mentions it here, but flexibility, you know, proper posture. Uh, is, is linked with, with uh, flexibility. If we don't have flexible hips, such as flexible hip flexors, uh, low back muscles, uh, gluteal muscles, if they're not in tone and if they're not flexible, we're more susceptible to those type of injuries and along with you know, using the, the uh, wrong body mechanics. So I tell people as far as body mechanics, I mean the rule of thumb is you really want to keep the load closest to your center of gravity. Exactly. So you want to keep everything close to your center of gravity, and you don't want to really overreach with your shoulders. Again, the whole load goes through the shoulders, which can affect the entire body also. So if we're going to lift something that's heavy, you know, I tell people, uh, if, it's, if it's something heavy, put a pillow down if you have to kneel, put something soft down, you know, reach down for it, keep it close if it's something heavy, close to your body, and then slowly come back up. Use something for support if you need it. If you know that Again, you have trouble getting back up. Use a chair, use a stool. Use that and lift your body up. But overreaching is a big no-no. Twisting and reaching is even worse of a no-no because then, again, you're putting all that stress through your hip, through your back, through your shoulders. So this is where we want to stay, the weight right in our, our center of gravity so that we're keeping 
keeping our, the objects really close to us, and we're preventing injury, not just at the hip, but the uh, overall the overall body. And if it's something light, I tell people, uh, if it's like a pencil or a pen off the floor, I tell people even pivot at the hip. Swing one leg out, and then come back up. Keep your back always straight. You know, very, very crucial. And if you're standing for a long period of time, make sure that you don't stand on one side too long. So let's say if I'm standing, if I'm a hairdresser, or if I'm a cashier, or uh, I'm a physical therapist, I don't want to stand on that one side, on my right side, for a very long time. So I have to stand up for like an hour, two hours, for a prolonged period of time, standing straight, and distribute your weight evenly on both sides. If you're getting tired, you can even shift your weight from side to side. And doing that, if you're going to be standing statically for a long period of time. Because by standing in one position, I tend to lean, or a person tends to lean on that side. And what can happen is a lot of the muscles become fatigued after a while. They become fatigued, and once the muscle fatigues, it locks up, goes into a muscle spasm. And I've seen this a lot with the hip, a lot of the rectus femoris, the tensor fascia lata, the TFL, my favorite Starbucks special mu muscle. It tightens up and can actually cause a lot, of, a lot of hip pain and relate to the back. And I see this so much with people that have back pain. These muscles in the front are so tight that it causes and it pulls the pelvis forward and you end up with a lot of back pain. And it's all caused by being in the wrong posture, doing things in an asymmetrical way. People that have a leg length problem, sometimes I'll fit them with, with uh, an insole or uh, a lift inside their shoe so that they, again, are symmetrical keeping themselves in that, in that symmetrical state. Um, so now if, if people now after, if you end up having some type of, some type of pain or in your hip or in your back or in any other part of, part of your body, I mean the, the steps are really, uh, really about the same. Use a brace if you can. It's hard to use really a, um, a brace for your hip, but sometimes it affects the back. So using a, a lumbar stabilization uh, belt for a, a short period of time, in the acute state, I know people that, I don't know if you've seen them before, people that walk around with those, those belts, those lumbar supports, and they live with that, which is actually not very good because you actually lose a lot of the muscle tone. So this is, I tell people, use a brace in the very beginning. When you're in a lot of pain, yeah, you want some relief from your pain, so use the brace. But then as it starts getting better, try to wean yourself off of the brace so you're not relying on it because you may end up getting worse if you're wearing this uh, continuously. Use anti-inflammatories like an NSAID or aspirin or ibuprofen if you can and if your doctor is again on board with you using those type of medications that's a great way of uh, early on in the, the initial stages of, of injury to calm down the inflammation because of an injury whether it's your, ha your hip, your back or any of, the, of those joints. Application and modalities. This is like the, another million dollar question get asked all the time, do I use hot or cold? So what do you guys think? What should you use if there's an injury right away? Cold. Cold. Everybody's in unison on that. Yeah, exactly. Using ice over an inflamed area that's already hot, you don't want to put something that's more hot or hotter on that area. That'll increase that inflammation. So in the first stages of injury, applying a cold modality ice for 15 minutes. More than 15 minutes is actually not very good. You're actually uh, causing more detrimental effects to it because you're causing a heating effect. Just like if you're staying outside for more than 15 minutes, you come in, your fingers get all hot after a while. So you want to use ice on any type of the body, on that part of the body that's inflamed for 15 minutes and do that repetitively. Maybe once every half hour or 15 minutes on, 15 minutes off. 15 minutes on, 15 minutes off until that pain starts to calm down. Then after a while, as you want some more flexibility in the muscles, that's when you start adding heat to a certain area. Physical therapy. Uh, I am a big, big uh, component or uh, uh, I think physical therapy you know, is, is a big part of rehab, a big part of uh, calming a lot of these type of injuries. Or if anything, surgical intervention. And this, for a lot of people, uh, should be one of the last resorts because of surgeries being, it's, it's 
it has an effect on the body, not just on that one particular area. But again, if you can avoid a surgery, you know, the better it is on your body because it's always better to let the body heal itself if it can. And there's certain, certain conditions and certain um, traumas that really need surgical intervention. And in that case, that's when it's fit. But if the body can heal itself and you can go through the flexibility and the physical therapy and you know, taking the anti-inflammatories to calm down that, that problem and take the steps needed to get better, it's always better to do that than having to go in for you know, last treatment surgical intervention, which a lot of times, especially with the back, a good 70 to 80% of the times people eventually end up getting back pain even after surgery. So it's better to treat the problem first, see where the, the components that you need to work on first are, and then move forward. Uh, surgical interventions, as much as I don't like surgeries, in case they, there are people that need to go in for surgeries, uh, arthroscopies are just surgical interventions where they're small incisions. So three holes being put in to make small changes in the hip area. Joint replacements, hip replacements. I know a few of you that have had a hip replacement. So a hip replacement is basically taking the head of the femur out, putting a new metal femur, and then a rod that goes through to hold, hold that in place. And sometimes they take away a lot of the acetabulum or they shave away some of the acetabulum that's filled with particularly arthritis, and they put a new uh, plastic-type uh, cup in that area with the lining to be able to hold the head of the femur, the new head of the femur. And these surgeries are actually, have been perfected. Uh, they're probably one of the best replacement surgeries in the body, just because we mentioned that the hip is a very stable joint, and it's a very small joint compared to other areas. So there's not a whole lot of trauma that goes on, or in, that's involved with it. So the replacement is, is relatively quick, and the recovery and the rehab is relatively quick compared to either a knee joint or a shoulder joint, which can be a lot more, uh, more, a lot more invasive. I've seen people coming out of hip surgery, hip replacements, and walking you know, normally after three weeks or even two weeks. So you know, it's not something to be too scared if that's something that you have to, have to go in for. A ligament reconstruction is not that common, um, but it has happened where people have torn their ligaments in their hips and they have to go in through arthroscopically. Uh, tendon repairs, another thing when one of the muscles may become weakened and over time inflamed, tendonitis will eventually or can eventually cause tendon, tendon ruptures, so they need to go in and repair it. The labrum repair, this is a pretty common repair because, like we said, and like Lily mentioned, the cartilage around the hip is not vascularized. There's not a whole lot of blood flow to that area. So if you have a dislocation or really bad dislocation of the hip, especially if your ligaments are really loose, you can cause the labrum to, to tear. So that's when uh, there needs to be a repair of the labrum itself. If it's a really bad repair or a really bad tear, again, there's nothing that you can physically do, whether it's physical therapy or any type of form of therapy, to really put those two pieces back together other than having to go in through surgery and putting them together. Uh, open reduction internal fixation, those are type of surgeries that people have when they have a fracture or trauma because of an accident or of a fall where either the neck of the, the femur or the shaft or the head is fractured and just like the picture shows there are screws and plates that are, that are put in to hold the femur in place. So enough with the surgeries. Preparation, pre-surgical preparation, flexibility, strengthening, decreasing the swelling, work on balance, and an exercise routine. And the same thing after, after surgery. And this goes for even without surgery. This is what typically will go on in a PT session is looking at what muscles need to be uh, worked on, what are the flexibility or where the, where the asymmetry is, working on those particular muscles, uh, working on the alignment of the body, doing exercises, giving a home exercise program. So that means not just our work, but it's the patient's work also to do that and continue that at home. Um, using an ambulated device or an assisted device, if necessary, for a short time, temporarily to hopefully in the future regain your, your range of motion, regain your uh, functional 
uh, activity. So quickly, some exercises that you can do to help strengthen and stretch out uh, the muscles of the hip, which is good for anybody, whether you have hip pain or hip problems. Uh, it's good for overall fitness, even for the core muscles, for, for the abdominals and for the back muscles. Like we said, they're very correlated with, with the hip. So a hamstring stretch. Um, maybe we can have Lily demonstrate that or come here and we'll do a hamstring stretch with Lily. We'll go through each one of these. Hamstrings are probably one of the tightest muscles for most people. Why do you guys think that is? Quickly. What are we doing for most of the day, most people? Sitting down. Hamstrings are always tightened in that position. Okay, so I want you to lay down. I'll keep one knee bent to stabilize the pelvis. Then with the other leg, the leg that you're trying to stretch, the hamstrings, you're lifting that one straight up until you feel a little bit of a pull behind the knee, keeping the knee straight. And then if you want to get a little bit of the hamstring further down, bending the knee a little bit. So Lily's going to bend the knee just maybe a couple of degrees and bringing that leg up, and you'll feel a pull right through the muscle belly. So it's good to do both. Good to get behind the knee a little bit, feeling that pull behind the knee where the, the hamstring attaches, and also the muscle belly itself of the hamstring. And a good stretch is maybe about 30 seconds, about three or four times. And you can do that with a rope. Lily can do it with a towel. She can hold on to it and pull straight up. Okay. Now the piriformis stretch. You want to do left, left, right? <laughs> Which one is tighter? Okay. Right one is tight. Left one is tighter. Okay. So if you want to do this at home, piriformis stretch, you're going to cross the leg that you want to stretch out. So if you want to do both, even better. You're going to cross that leg over. And then I tell people to lift the opposite leg. And you, in Lily, you can grab onto the right leg and pull. And you'll feel it. The piriformis is a very small muscle, but a very important muscle because it controls a lot of rotation in the hip, and that can get very tight over time. So by doing that, you'll feel it if you're doing it right, right in the middle of the buttocks. That's when you know you're doing it correctly. All right, same thing, 15 to 30 seconds. Lower back down. You can do the same thing on the other side. Bridging, very important because bridging affects what muscle? Affects the gluteus, the gluteus maximus muscle. And again, that muscle helps us stand up, helps, helps us walk, keeps our balance. So to do a proper bridge, and a lot of people do this sometimes incorrectly, uh, you never want to arch your back while you're doing a bridge. You want to make sure that first you have the stability at the pelvis, so tightening up your abdominal muscles, flattening out your back, and then using your gluteal muscles to lift up off the floor, using your hands for support and for stability holding that position for maybe about three or four seconds, and then coming back down. Okay, very, very effective, especially for people that have back pain uh, and uh, for hip problems. A straight leg raise. Um, make sure that this is also done correctly, because a lot of times this can cause hip type, pain, hip type, uh, type pains. You want to focus especially on using the, um, the quadricep muscles and some of the hip muscles. So with the opposite knee bent, stabilizing the pelvis. Again, tightening up your pelvic muscles, flattening out your back before you do the straight leg raise is very important. So as your belly is flat, or your, your back is flat, your belly is tight, bring your toes up. Your toes should be up. Leg straight, bringing it up to about 45 degrees, and then slowly bringing it back down. If you start feeling any type of back pain or hip pain, Associated with that, stop doing it. That means your, your abdominal muscles are probably not that strong. You shouldn't be doing that exercise. Okay, so it's very important to keep that in mind. Squats, like uh, Lily was mentioning, you don't want to ever put yourself with your knees exceeding a certain angle, especially in front of your toes when you're doing a squat. So, Lily, I'll do it. So when you're doing a squat, I always tell people, Try to picture yourself sitting into a chair, just like the picture shows. I mean, that's a perfect squat right there. If you had a chair right underneath her, it would look like she's going to sit down. So that's basically the idea. You want to keep your back always straight, just like the picture shows. Your knees should always be in front of your toes and reaching down and back up and keeping these muscles always tight. Down 
and back up. Always keeping my knees in front of my toes so I'm not damaging my hips or my patella, or my kneecaps. And the last thing is the lunge. This one's really advanced. Uh, try it if, if you have any pain while you're doing it. Don't push yourself. Go ahead, Lily. Right, so knee bent at 90 degrees. The opposite leg behind you, and it's straight down. So both knees being bent. Your heel on the back foot is going up. You're going straight down. If you feel any pain inside your knee, don't go that far down. If it still bothers you, hold off on the lunge and going straight down. And again, you want to keep your body upright, straight, abdominals tight. Because like I said, it's all correlated. Abdominals, back muscles, and the hip muscles should all work in harmony together. Okay, so those are basic exercises. If anybody wants a copy of them, I can always make a copy of them uh, for after. Okay, good. Um, now, I'm sorry, go ahead, Lou. Mm. Right. So, well, we both thank you for coming. And before we end, any other questions? Any open questions about the hip? Hopefully just about the hip. We'll take other questions maybe personally <laughs> later. Comments, only good comments. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yes. The rumba. A lot of gluteal muscles in the rumba. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you don't want to run run a, a sports car with uh, you know broken broken tailpipe or broken engine or broken piston. So same thing. You want to make sure that you're addressing the problems that need to be addressed first. Flexibility, your strength is is up to par, and that you're doing your functional activities correctly and without pain. And then yeah, those other activities, dancing, you know, sporting activities, you know, are fantastic. If you can do them. Dancing is a great exercise. Yes. Yeah. A warm up. There are many things you can do for warm up. Yeah. yeah. So sitting in a chair for you know ten minutes with doing nothing, that's not a warm up. Walking maybe in a track at a comfortable pace, moving your arms, you know, from side to side, that's a nice warm up. That's what most most uh, athletes are doing now anyway. Warm up, no stretching, exercise instead, and then cool down and stretch at the very end. So that's that's the new way of thinking because you need that strength. When you overstretch a muscle, you actually lose some of its strength. So you don't want to really stretch out before you're doing an exercise that excessively and then do the exercise and stretch at the very end so that you prevent it. Oh, so yeah. So it's always warm up, exercise, cool down, stretch. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. This is exactly what we were just talking about. Um, by stretching a muscle, I mean, think of it as a piece of plastic. If you're overstretching or you're stretching a piece of plastic, what happens to its strength? It's not as strong as if it was if it was taut. So if you're stretching a muscle out and then you expect to put in an enormous amount of force through it, it's going to fatigue. It's going to lose the strength that it that it originally had, and it's going to fail, or it may fail quicker than if you didn't stretch before. So a warm up will prevent injury by getting blood flowing to that spot. So that will in itself allow the the body to start moving, start acting, getting ready to do a particular activity, and then 
the cool down again will allow that excessive heat to escape you know the, the blood flow the new getting the new oxygenated blood to that area and then doing a stretch after will prevent any of the muscle fibers from tightening up doing your your activity walking out or going to the store or sitting down in the car so that you're not you know tightened after doing an activity and you can injure yourself after that so that's that's the new way of thinking right now that's what they've done studies that athletes should never really stretch uh, or excessively stretch before before doing a sporting activity whether it's dancing or baseball basketball anything like that but yeah that's the, i mean it could be it could be the you know yeah Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. People are living longer. They're living their lives longer, which is great. But you have to live your life, you know, in a in a way that won't cause you injuries later on too. So that's that's an important thing. The more people are informed, and that's why you know these these educational series are good because we like to inform people about their own health so that they're aware of it, aware of it. And the more you're aware of a particular activity or, or doing something the correct way, the less chance you're, you're going to end up with, with an injury. So prevention, you know, like they say, is worth a, you know, a thousand cures. So really important. Do I have any tri trivia questions? Yeah. Uh, not anything that's going to buy you any points, I don't think. I didn't get any yet. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I can give you a trivia question if you want. I'm gonna, I don't have anything to give. Give you a, a chance of a free massage. I got it. Okay, I would too.